Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Holotube. And we are thrilled to have uh, Peter Rier um, talk about big operators in holography. Pedro, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. And um, uh, first, uh, first of all, let me uh, apologize to everyone, in particular to Matthias, for uh, not showing up the last time. But I, I really, I have no good excuse. I mean, I just totally blanked and forgot about it. So thank you very much for accommodating a second opportunity to tell you about what I think is some fun work that um, we did with um, my student Jacob, Francesco Aprile, and uh, Rob Myers, where we tried to understand how to do holography for very big uh, operators. And so I'll keep this very informal. So I hope that uh, you guys ask questions during the talk. If you can keep your cameras on, it's more fun. Then I can see if people are nodding, disagreeing, uh, shocked, uh, or bored by what I'm saying. Uh, so if your internet is good enough and if you can keep your cameras on, that's more fun for me. And otherwise, this is more or less the plan for what I would like to do. I would like to basically explain this picture, tell you what is this, uh, what is this picture about, where I have, uh, I can already anticipate the boundary of the sitter, and then some bananas that go from one point of the boundary to another point of the boundary. And my goal is in the first part to explain what is this picture, where does it come from? And then I would like to discuss some generalization of this picture where we consider instead of two-point functions, some three-point functions, and some speculations and some open problems at the end. And this should be rather informal, like I said. OK, uh, can you see my screen? Is everything OK? Everything is visible. OK. Very good. So, so then, so as I said, uh, in holography, we are often used to having the boundary of ABS. Then we have some holographic direction in ABS. And we are often used to having probes that we send from the boundary, like some propagator that we emit from the boundary. And then we could have some probes that interact in some point in the bulk P that we could perhaps integrate over or, uh, or not. Well, it depends on the problem. And so this is an example where this is just a probe. And this probe could be a string, could be a particle, could be a D brain. But it could be something that, even if it's heavy, like a heavy particle, it's still a probe. And the geometry would not change. And the geometry would still be just ADS. And we would have just the ADS matrix dz square plus the boundary matrix over z square plus this probe moving on it. And the probe is inside this matrix. Okay, let me not put plus because it looks like I'm changing the matrix. I'm not changing the matrix. So we have this matrix and okay, maybe some funny plus. And then there is the probe on top of this matrix. And then there's an obvious question which is what happens, what if we replace this probe or we make the probe very heavy? And the obvious thing that happens is that now we will have back reaction. And the geometry now will be affected by this probe. So the geometry. will change. So let's think a bit. So what exactly do we expect? What is the intuition? So if you look at this picture up here, imagine these are three geodesics, three heavy particles. So then there's a beautiful geometrical problem you can do where you have three geodesics. You solve this geodesic. You have some length for each geodesic, and you find this point that is the optimal point, and that would be the computation of a three-point function of three very heavy operators. They would be roughly described by three geodesics that meet at the point 
and the location of this point is the optimal location to minimize the sum of the three lengths. Now, what happens now if this point becomes heavier and heavier and heavier, at some point it becomes a Schwarzschild black hole and starts back reacting the metric and it will change the metric in the vicinity of the point, but not far away. And so we would expect the picture as follows, where we have the boundary of ADS, and then uh, we have some kind of operator. It's not really a point, but it's something fatter. And now it's a little bit fat. There is a small region around the operator where here it's not ADS anymore. The geometry is not ADS in some region. And this could be some slightly bigger region, not just some points. But inside some region, it's not ADS. But if you are far away, here in this region, here far away, here it would be ADS. And if you are at the boundary and far away, this would be the usual boundary of ADS. But if even if you are at the boundary, but if you are close to the boundary, this point would not be just a standard boundary of ADS. Because now therefore, we are inserting some huge probe that is strong enough to back react the geometry. And so the question is, how do we do holography in this situation where the probes are so heavy that we don't even have a nice RD boundary where we can put the probes and then throw them inside and let them change the geometry. We really have to understand how the probes themselves can back react on the geometry, change the geometry, and we have to understand how to set up the dictionary, how to define this, such that if we compute the left-hand side by doing some gravity computation, we will be computing in the gauge theory, the correlation function in this picture of three operators, and these operators, O1, O2, and O3, they would be inserted at some position, X1, X2, and X3, and they would be all very heavy. And the question is, we want to set up this precisely, understand what are the boundary conditions in gravity, how to do the computations in the gauge theory, so that this equality holds. Okay? And that would be the goal of this program that we started trying to explore, uh, uh, like I told. Again, interrupt me, please, with any, any question. OK, so the basic idea is following, uh, we will follow more or less some logic that uh, Romuald Yannick used when studying strings. You see, already with strings, you can ask the following question. Suppose, again, let's go back to the, the probe case and consider just a geodesic that goes from one point to the other. So this is just a geodesic in ADS, so an arc of a circle. And you ask, how does this work when I replace this point particle if I replace it by a string. Now, a string is still a light object, right? It's just a small loop of energy. It will not back react the geometry. But now this string will have to, I don't know, it could be some kind of folded string, some kind of helix, say, that will propagate in space time. And this helix will go from one point to the other. So this could be some kind of spinning. Yeah, this is a terrible picture of some kind of spinning string going from one point of the boundary to the other. Okay. And you would ask, how is this motion? How do I study this propagation of a string from one point x1 to a point x2? And one way to do it is as follows. You first don't think of ADS in point correct coordinates, think of it yes in global coordinates. In global coordinates, ADS is just a cylinder. So this is the same space, but now we do ADS in global coordinates. And this geodesic, I can think of it as coming from infinity to infinity, from minus infinity and just moving up. 
And in this picture, this would be like putting this point at zero and this point at infinity. And then you have a geodesic that just goes up. And this trajectory of this geodesic in this picture in global ADS is very boring. It is just a point in the middle of ADS going up. And you go from here to here by simply change a variable. So it's the same thing. You just change from the cylinder to Poincaré coordinates and you would get this picture. And then if you want to bring infinity to a finite point, you just do an isometry that changes zero infinity to any points x1 and x2. And from this to this, from this picture to this picture, you will do some isometry. But now it's clear what you could do. You could start in global ADS. with a string that would be some kind of string. I don't know, as I said, some Alex, for example, something that like some DNA strand. Oh my God, my pictures of strings are terrible. But it would be some string. And then just, uh, just move from globe, this global picture where the string moves forever from minus infinity to plus infinity. And many people were studying solutions in global ADS forever. Right? I mean, that's I plane was doing solutions with one spin, two spins, three spins, spinning in the sphere, spinning in EDS. You have a ton of infinite number of solutions. In fact, they can all be described very beautifully by some kind of finite gap solutions that uh, Volodya, Kazakov, and collaborators describe. So you have some solutions that are just there in EDS moving forever. And then you just go from EDS to Poincaré, from global EDS to Poincaré, and then you do an isometry and you get a beautiful string that moves from one point to the other. Okay? So there was this combination of going from global, then you went from global to Poincaré, and then in Poincaré, you do some funny, some simple isometry so that you put the points at finite locations instead of zero and infinity. So it's a simple path to do. Any question here? Okay. So if not, let's try to follow the same route in ADS. And we start with the analog of a simple solution. And the simple solution would be the ADS black hole. So we'll start with the analog of a string moving in the middle of ADS. But now it's not a string, it's a black hole. So let's draw the black hole. So these are global ADS coordinates, okay? So this is the radius R. This is the time tau. And then this would be some sphere omega uh, D minus one. And then uh, the black hole is what? It's an object that has some finite length, some finite size. So this size here, this radius, RH, would be the radius of the horizon. And then it's a cylinder inside this cylinder. And so this would be the black hole. And what would be, so let's quickly just write the metric of the black hole. So the metric of this black hole, it has some function of radius times d tau square plus some function dr squared over this blackening factor f of r plus r squared times a d minus one sphere. We are doing ADSP. And this f of r is just one plus r squared. And if it was just ADS, you would stop here. But then if you have a black hole, there is a, an extra term minus m over r to the d minus two. So you see that when d is equal to 2, uh, so here we are doing a d s d plus 1, which is dual to c f t d. So when we are doing with the 2d c f t, it is just a constant shift, the, this black hole. When we do d equals 3, 4, uh, 3, 4, etc., both dimensions, uh, the boundary dimensions, then we change it in a more non trivial way. And this would be our starting method. Okay. Um, any questions? 
And so now the idea is to go from these coordinates. So let's go from these coordinates. Um, and let's map it to point correct coordinates, where we will map this point A to the origin, and then this point B here at infinity to infinity. Okay, so let's do it. So we do, we follow this usual change of coordinates that we do when we do radial quantization. So let me tell you what we do. We say that this time here that you see goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. The change of variables will be that this time tau will be equal to one half logarithm of z square plus r square. So let me mark what these coordinates are. So r would be this coordinate here and z would be this coordinate here. And so you see that tau moving in tau is moving in domes. So this would be some tau, and then some bigger tau would be some bigger dome. Right? So I would have some, some, some domes, some spherical domes, half spherical domes. And this would be moving in tau. And so this point here in the middle would correspond to tau equal minus infinity, which is z equals z bar equal z equal r equal zero, it's tau equal minus infinity. And z and r equal infinity is tau equal to plus infinity. And then uh, we would say that these coordinates are the radius in ADS would be equal to capital R over z, which means that fixing small r is fixing a cone. So now if we fix, let's go to the boundary, say the boundary of the black hole, for example, the horizon of the black hole corresponds to r over z equal to some constant, so it's some cone. So there will be this cone, and this cone here would be the radius of the black hole, the horizon radius. And then if you increase the radius, you see, if you increase the radius, then you would go to some other cone here. And this cone would correspond to moving to some fixed R bigger than RH. Okay? And you see that when R goes to infinity, which means you go to the boundary of ADS at R equal to infinity, that corresponds to Z equal to zero. So it's really, you flatten up this cone all the way to the bottom. And traveling, so, so you have these cones and traveling along the cone is traveling here in the in the in the in this picture back and forth. Any question here? And so the picture is that the black hole, once we go to global point correct coordinates is a cone. So the cone, it's a cone that starts with some slope that is governed by this RH and then opens up more and more and more. And the more farther away you are from this cone, the more the closer you are to the boundary in the original picture and also in the point correct picture. And now what can you do? Now you just go here in this picture, right? And now you could, okay, first, Okay, if you want, just uh, for curiosity, um, we could write now the metric, the uh, square in the cone. So we just do that change of variables, but let me just write it a little bit so that you can see more or less what you would get. You would get something like one over z square, and then there would be some dz square plus some dr plus dz square plus r square d omega square, where now there would be some functions r that will just depend on the cone coordinates, some function here h that would just depend on the cone coordinates, and some function v that would just depend on the cone coordinates. And then turning off the black hole would be setting all these functions to, to zero. Right? 
or to H1 and V to zero. Yeah. And uh, where this H and V are some simple function, and this would be the cone metric. And now what you would do, you have this cone metric here. That, as we said, this uh, describes now the Euclidean black hole where one operator is at zero, one operator is at infinity. And now what you can do is just construct what we call the banana metric, which is just the cone metric where you change coordinates under an isometry where X goes to X tilde and Z goes to Z tilde, where this change is what we call an ADS isometry. The kind of transformations that implement conformal transformations at the boundary of ADS. Okay, the kind of transformation that at the boundary they act as special conformal and so on, but in the bulk they act non trivially. Just to remind you, it's something like x tilde is equal to x minus um, b x squared plus z squared over some wild vector, etc. So it is just a transformation that will send this point zero it will map it to some point x1 and it will take this point infinity and map it to some point x2 but then after you do it what happens what happens is exactly what i drew here that now the image of the cone if you do a conformal transformation of a cone what you get is a banana that's what a banana is a banana is a conformal transformation of the cone where you being infinity to a finite point and then we get this picture here, where there is an inner layer of the banana, which is where the horizon was. So that's the yellow part. If we want, we can put a peel on the banana, which will be a stretched horizon, epsilon away from the horizon of the banana. And this is what we call the stretched horizon. That's just a radius slightly bigger than the horizon, which means in this case, a peel slightly outside the core of the banana. And if we are at some radius, which is bigger than the banana, then we have some... So this green surface a little bit far away. So this is the picture. So this was the first part that I wanted to do, which was to explain the picture. But I did not explain the equal sign. Now I would like to turn and explain this equal sign. So I told you now what the metric is, and we could now discuss what about this equal sign relating this picture with this metric, which again is just the metric of the usual black hole after a few simple transformations so that we can see it in global ADS. And now we would like to discuss how to interpret. But let me emphasize first again that what we see here is a metric, which has exactly the property that I said before, that the metric is ADS. If I am very far away, which means here it's ADS, here at the boundary, far away, it will be roughly boundary of ADS without, as it was before. But otherwise, if you are close to the punctures in this region, where if, or if you are in this region, the metric is not at all ADS and it's back reactive. Okay. And so the punchline now is that indeed, after this transformation, we have these bananas. And now the question is, what happens if I compute what's the relation between these bananas and the correlation function of two very heavy operators that are so heavy that they correspond to some black hole state at position x1 and the black hole state at position x2. So that's the question we would like to answer. Okay. Any question here? Okay. Uh, there's no one has their camera on. I hope people are there and my connection is good. Can someone confirm that my sound is good and that it's yeah, we we hear you. It's all good. <laughs> okay. All just good. Very nice talk. Since so, thanks. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Okay. So, what do we expect? We expect that this correlation function is given by some path integral. And this path integral should be localized at the solution, at the optimal solution, this minimal solution. 
And so we expect that this correlation function should be roughly the exponential of the action, the gravitational action corresponding to this geometry. So that would be the guess where we have this gravitational action. Okay. Now, if you do it, the first thing you have to do is to think that this gravitational action is not really finite. And with you, as usual, with uh, all these holographic computations, we need to regular. We need to regularize. And the usual thing we do, and uh, this I'm sure is common in most of the seminars here, given the topics that you guys normally discuss, is to say that I don't go all the way to the boundary. I will stay some epsilon away from the boundary. And so we can put a surface here at the boundary, a surface here is some epsilon away that says that we stay epsilon away from the boundary. We don't go all the way to the boundary. We put some plane here. You see this plane will intersect this banana in two small circles. And we could say we stay epsilon away from uh, the boundary. And indeed, if you do it with this epsilon cutoff, with this cutoff epsilon, what you get is the following. You reproduce that this result is indeed exponential. And then the result that you get is logarithm of the separation between the points, x1 minus x2 square, divided by epsilon square. So that's fine. That's just units, just as telling you that uh, this is setting the units on which you measure the distance. And then the result that you get here is minus uh, f, where f, let me write it up here, f is the free energy per, uh, per beta, which is equal to the energy of the black hole, which is just the mass of the black hole, minus the entropy of the black hole at that mass times the temperature of the black hole at that mass. So notice that let's make let's make two observations. One observation is that it's kind of it's not surprising because we are just doing usual black hole thermodynamics in different metrics. And we know that black hole thermodynamics is the free energy of the black hole. So it's not very surprising, but I will discuss this in slightly more detail in the next few seconds. So it's not a surprise, but it's not good. We don't want to get this result. We don't want to get the free energy times this. Why not? Because you see that if, if we get this result, this would mean that the two point function of my two operators, O1, O2, would be equal to one over the separation between the points to the power of the free energy, which again is the energy minus S times T. And that's not what we want. What we want is this, just the energy. I don't want this term here is not what we want. I want to get in a CFT, one over the separation of the points to the power of the dimension of my operator, which is just the energy, delta. I don't want to get this entropy. So let's first recap. Why do we get the entropy? Because you see, the computation we are doing is basically just computing the gravity action for this solution, just doing it in different coordinates, right? But we know what we get here. We know this solution is stationary. So we know if we compute the energy, it is just going to be some constant solution times the interval of time delta tau that we computed. And this delta tau is just the interval of time where we evaluate from this interval to this interval. So it would be if I evaluate it in some big interval delta tau here. That interval in the banana picture, if, I, if you see that you have some interval in delta tau here, you see? It maps to a dilatation in these coordinates. So 
translations in tau map to dilatations in these coordinates. And so a delta tau will be mapped to log of delta x. So that's the explanation of why it is just a free energy times delta x. And usually what do we do? We say that we compute the free energy of the black hole, and then we identify time periodically. We make time periodic, and this is what sets the temperature of the black hole. But here we are not doing it. Here we are saying, no, it's not up to you to tell me what tau is. Tau, for me, is the separation between the points. I don't want to identify it with any temperature of the black hole. Right? So normally what we would do in this case is that we would compute this computation, but here, instead of log of the distance, we would have the temperature of the black hole, not what we want. But the temperature of the black hole was kind of crucial to put this temperature of the black hole to avoid a conical singularity at the horizon. If you don't put this temperature identified as it is, this point where the horizon is would be a conical singularity. And so that's what tells you that you should periodically identify with that precise temperature. And that's how we determine the temperature of the black hole. And so this hints at what should be the solution to this uh, conundrum. What we should do is, because there is a conical singularity at the horizon, we should not go all the way to the horizon, but we should, as we approach the horizon, we should go all the we should put a, a membrane and we should cut the solution x1 away from the horizon. And so we, we cut the solution. You see that the boundary now, it's in the more natural boundary for this problem is not just this boundary of the boundary of ADS, but the surface goes all the way to the boundary. So it intersects this boundary. So the bound, the correct boundary that you should consider is the usual boundary. Let's call it a B1 union with this stretched horizon B2. So the correct boundary that we should consider for our gravitational path integral, where the space ends, is the boundary of ADS plus the peel of the banana, the, the cover of the banana, which could create, which would be put at R equal to RH plus X. And so what do I mean by this? I mean that when we compute the exponential of the gravity action, this gravity action should be the bulk gravity action plus and then we put a gibbon Hawking's term, which is a boundary term, to make sure that the gravitational path integral is well-defined. And normally, we put it at this boundary 1, which is this boundary of ADS, this region here. And what we are saying is, no, you should also put a gibbon Hawking's term in this boundary 2, which is this stretched horizon where the black hole is slightly inside. Ah. Anyway, cutting the little tips because the uh, so we cut a little bit the tips, we stay epsilon away. Okay. And what happens beautifully, in my opinion, is that when we include this second Gibbon Hawking's term, what this Gibbon Hawking's term is doing is precisely changing ensemble from canonical to microcanonical, and the effect of putting this extra term that we didn't do it the first time we did the computation is precisely killing this entropy times temperature. And so we have a full prescription. You should consider the your black hole's geometry, this banana. The banana is the place where space ends. There's nothing inside the banana. Remember that when we have an Euclidean black hole, the horizon of the black hole is what people call the tip of the cigar. So there's nothing there. You cannot go inside. If you try, you just pass by the tip of the cigar and go away. And so the banana is where space ends. And what you should do is put a stretched horizon slightly before where space ends and put the boundary, put the gravitational boundary term both at the boundary of the space and at the boundary of the banana where space ends. And if you do it, and then you compute the gravitational path integral, 
you recover one over the distance to the power of the mass of the black hole, which is the energy, which is, of course, what you expect in a CFD. Let me make that a question here. Can you hear me? Yes. So it seems that this prescription depends on what which ensemble you start in. So you you started in an ensemble where the free energy is is the is the relevant potential to that ensemble that you start in. Um, and then, then this prescription performs for you a, a Legendre transform. So I'm just wondering how how do you determine what you start, like which ensemble you are, are actually starting? What determines which ensemble you're starting? Um, yeah, I, you are exactly right. So we know that uh, the usual prescription of uh, Gibbon and Hawkins computes things at fixed temperature. So let me maybe draw here uh, the picture in global again. So I have global ADS. And again, usually what we do is we put the black hole. And then a quantity we often compute is not a two-point function, but it's a partition function, trace e to the minus beta h, which where beta is related to this identification, beta. And then we identify this line and this line. And this is what it is. It's just computing this sum over all states e to the minus beta times the energy of the state. Now, another thing we could do is forget about uh, holography and forget about uh, um, boundary and correlation functions. What we could do also is imagine that I have a computation where I don't want to compute this Z, but I want to imagine that I create my black hole state. I evolve it for some time delta tau which is my choice. No one can tell me what time I evolve. It's my choice, delta tau. And then I annihilate the state again. And this is not given by this quantity. This is just e to the minus the energy of the black hole times delta tau. Right? It's, not, it's not the same quantity. And so the question one could ask is, how in gravity do we do the second type of computations? And you could ask it even in flat space. Even in flat space, we could compute the free energy of a black hole. But you could ask, no, I don't want the free energy. I want to change ensemble and go to this ensemble where I fix the black hole state and I just evolve a single black hole state for some time. And the correct prescription seems to be, even in flat space, that what you should do in this case is to fix the microstate. You should put some stretched horizon at the black hole. And you add a given Hawking term at the horizon. If you do it, that has the effect of killing the entropy and going from this computation, which is e to the minus beta times the free energy, and the free energy is energy minus s times t. And what this computation is, is first, because you do delta tau instead of beta, you put here delta tau instead of beta. Because this beta is just how much time you evolve. Everything is constant in time, so that part is trivial. But the second thing it does is it kills this term by adding this given Hawking term. After we put out the paper, we were told that actually Hawking had already understood this in flat phase. And, uh, and indeed, there was a beautiful paper, and uh, I think we cited in version two of our paper where he explained exactly that if you wanted to do the second computation, this would be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last thing we did was understand now, the, now it's a minor step. If you want now to think of this picture, now in this picture here, where you have the banana. <laughs> 
all you have to follow carefully is to basically realize that this delta tau is going to be related to logarithm of the separation of the point. Because the separation of this point, if you follow it carefully, was what delta tau was. And then when you do it, you recover what you expect for a CFT 2.5. Okay, so, so the punchline, what we learned here is that the black hole is a banana with two tips. And the two tips are the two insertions. And there are two insertions because we are doing a 2.5. Okay, let me mention a few other things we could do and uh, that I did not discuss, but that will be now very easy to do. Now we have a background, right? Which is this banana, where you have a point at x1 and a point at x2. Now you could consider, for example, a probe moving in this background. Now you could put a probe going from X3 to X4, and it will be some geodesic. And this geodesic would be slightly deformed. Its trajectory will be slightly deformed because of the gravitational force in this felt because of, of the presence of this heavy body, which is the banana. And so this computation, for example, now, divided by the same thing without the probe, would be computing the four-point function of what people call heavy, heavy, light, light for these points, x1 up to x4. And if you do it, this computation is a beautiful check of all this construction that you get exactly what you expect for this correlation function. What do I mean by this? What do you expect? You expect to see that what this solution does is basically change some graviton between this solution and this. And so you expect to see this object to be to have in the conformal, in the OPE expansion, to have an OPE where here you see a graviton. And indeed, that's precisely what you see with the right coefficient, right numbers, et cetera, for this to work. <laughs> okay. So then the question is, uh, okay, so then one question we would like to understand, which was the second part that I wanted to discuss, which is what about generalizations of this picture? Because what we did so far was kind of trivial. Of course, we knew the result. It's not like we are computing something that we did not know. Of course, two point functions in a CFT are one over the distance to the power of delta. So we were doing, we were suffering a lot to get the boring trivial result that it's obvious. So of course, it is one over the separation to the mass of the black hole. But we needed to clean up the details, see what the geometry is, see exactly what the cutoffs are, what exactly is the prescription to get this result. But it's not like the result is that shocking. It's obvious. Notice also that the normalization of this result is not physical, because you can always multiply an operator by any number you want, and that's just defined. So you always have this freedom of multiplying the operator. So a quantity that would be very non-trivial is the three-point function. The three-point function, an obvious generalization which would be very interesting, is the three-point function. And by three-point function, what I mean more precisely is the correlation function of one, or two, or three, divided by a bunch of two-point functions of O1, O1, etc. And this is normalization independent. So now it's properly normalized. It's saying that I compute the three-point functions with the two-point functions normalized to one. You see, I kind of did it here implicitly. I wrote at some point some one here. Okay, so if we normalize it down to one, now the three-point function is well-defined. And so what do we expect for this result? We expect now an interesting number, C, one, two, three, times, some simple space-time dependence, it's something like x1 minus x2 to the power delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3, etc. And this should be the exponential of some gravitational action. 
And now this number is a very non-trivial number. And this number, we don't know. What is it? And this number, you would think of it as some kind of black hole merger, where you have some two very big black holes that merge into a third black hole. Or a black hole decay, where you have a black hole that decays into some very big black hole. And so a very interesting question that people have not explored much yet is, how do we study this object both in gravity and in gauge theory? And this is more or less an interesting problem to study big operators in gravity and in gauge theory. So in the remaining five minutes, let me tell you a little bit of some progress that we did in understanding this problem in a simplified setup, which is three dimensions, because in 3D gravity, things are simpler. And things are more topological. Gravity is mostly topological. And we can do things that in other dimensions we struggle to do. Any question here? Okay. Uh, in fact, now it's, I think I've been speaking for 57 minutes since you started recording. So I, I think another option is, what I was going to do now is to describe 3D gravity and three-point functions. And then I was going to move to some speculations and, um, and open problems. But instead, uh, instead, maybe we could open to questions. And if you guys want, I can speculate or tell you more details about three-point functions. But I think we could move to a more informal discussion now and uh, uh, keep it more informal now. I don't know. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, if, if this is over into a discussion. So let, let me first thank you for a very inspiring and clear talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and then with that, we open the, the floor for questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Thinking about uh, this probably belongs to the speculation section, but uh, could one consider thermal two point functions? So a banana in a black hole background, which uh, uh, in the, the problem here is that, of course, you don't have this uh, nice uh, transformation that guides you to what the geometry of the banana is. But... So, indeed. You see that when you do this banana, what do these point three and four feel? They feel they 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 are their computation is the same as the two point function O three O four, which are both light operators in the thermal black hole. Right? Because you just have a very heavy banana, the very heavy banana effectively generates a background where three and four propagate. This equal sign is okay, up to some wild transformation. So if you wild transform carefully, again, to put the points at zero, infinity, and so on, then what three and four, the result you would get for three and four should be what you get if you just do a thermal computation where you put the black hole at temperature beta, where the temperature beta will be given by the mass that you choose to put for the operator one and two. Yeah, but that's just going back to your starting point on, <laughs> on global AVS. That's right. Now, a harder question is what would happen if I had two bananas? Right, exactly. What would happen if you have a banana back reacting with a, that's right. a black so that's hole a or another banana? Question. That's a very interesting question that I think some people have the tools to address. It's a problem that now you could ask, I have two bananas. And what these bananas will do is that there will be some tidal forces, right? That will push a little bit the shape of this banana towards the other, right? And th this banana here, it will also be pushed, your eyes and will be pushed a bit towards the other. So it's a bit like if you have two black holes and they are very far away, then they are like this, but you bring them closer to each other and they start deforming a bit, right? Right, so if you bring two black holes, their, their horizons would start being deformed as the black holes are closed. So in NGR, there is a technique for if you have a metric that is mostly given by G1 and mostly given by G2, 
And the total metric is roughly G1 plus G2 plus correction when the things are separated. And so you could say that the metric here, for example, when they start to fill each other is roughly G1 plus G2 plus delta G, where delta G is the first interaction between the two black holes, the first effect of tidal forces. And this, there are some nice operators that people that study GR solutions, they have nice descriptions on how to efficiently compute this correction to, uh, to these bananas. And so this would give, so if we apply it in this formalism, this, uh, I forgot, there, it has a, a nice name. I don't know, some people in the audience might know. Some quadratic operator that acts on this delta G. This would be resumming all these graviton exchanges from this, these bananas that are back reacting, that are inducing the back reaction of one banana on the other and creating the deformation of one banana in the other. Again, people do this kind of thing when they study black hole solutions when they have two black holes. So it's a, the metric is more or less Schwarzschild one plus Schwarzschild two. But when the black holes become closer, now it's no longer true. And you want to ask what's the first correction and there is some technology for doing that. It will be very nice to apply that technology whoever is specialist in it, for this problem. And uh, start with two bananas, start them far away. That means that X1, X2, and X3, X4 are very far away. It's like an OPE limit where one and two and three and four are far away. And then the corrections to this OPE, the interesting part is as you bring them together, the first correction will be incorporated into this tidal effect that will be governed by the correction to the metric. And that will correct the cur so this will say that the correlation function of o1 o2 o3 o4 when they are all heavy in this configuration it would be roughly one two with three four that's the boring thing but then uh, there would be exponential of this correction from delta g mm -hmm. and this would be the interesting part that we would be computing I think Kevin has a question, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi, Pedro. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about this idea of um, adding a Gibbons Hawking term at a stretched horizon. Mm -hmm. I think I can just about wrap my brain around that when you have an eternal black hole. But what, what happens if you have a dynamical black hole? Like if you're if I'm asking a question about forming a black hole, for example. You know the the usual question of like the event horizon um, forms in principle be before the actual collapse. <laughs> I mean, what, do I add a do I add a given talking term when the black hole actually forms, or it, it, do you see my point? Then, um, right. I think you would ask the same question. So first, let me make a small comment is that here, what we do is Euclidean. So yeah. everything is Euclidean. And so the horizon is not the place where the things fall and don't come out. It's the end of space. Yeah. So what do I mean by the end of space? For example, if I have the banana, and now we have this geometry that I wrote the metric at some point. And now I consider geodesics that go from one point to the other. And they do something like this if they are far from the banana. And if they are close to the banana, what they do is something like this. And then it's like they avoid the banana and go to some other point. So if I throw geodesic all the way in the banana, what they do is like that. They go and then they avoid the banana and go to another point. So this is how geodesics move in this space. Because the banana is the end of space. There's nothing there. It's like this is the analog. Maybe if I have the tip of the cigar, and I throw a geodesic, and the geodesic goes and avoids the tip and goes to some, some other position. Right? right? So the, the analog of the tip of the cigar and geodesic is not going through the tip of the cigar in this picture is that you have these geodesics and they never enter the banana and they avoid the banana. And they, when they approach the banana, they don't go inside the banana. And so you could define this horizon as the place that the geodesics don't go. And that defines where the horizon is. And now you put something slightly away from that. This definition would extend to higher point functions. Now with higher point functions, what you would do is locally, now we learn how locally the solutions behave because we can use the two point function to learn about the boundary conditions close to each puncture. 
But then if you want to say, what does it mean to have an horizon inside? Where is the horizon inside? I would say it's the place where space ends, which means it's the place where geodesics don't go. And that will define me some horizon. And then I would put some stretched horizon slightly away from uh, that. So that's how the proposal would go for three points. And how would you do it in practice? Again, I would need help probably from numerical people that would be able to solve this GR problem if I want to do this in four dimensions, for example. But in 3D, no. In 3D, because everything is very topological, there we could do things analytical. In some four dimensional example with lots of supersymmetry, we also hope to be able to do things analytically. And we are exploring a little bit the gauge theory side first to, do, to get some intuition about what to expect. But except for some particular cases, the rest, the, the, the tool that should always work is numerics. You have to find this solution. But sometimes you should be able to do something nice and analytical. Thank you. Okay. So maybe interjecting on that point, um, this this question about which which boundaries to take into account when evaluating your gravitational action, um, like that that seems to and, and then what which which counter terms or boundary terms to um, to to add. That's a very interesting question. So, so do you think that it can, in some sense, um, help with these dynamical situations where um, there are several definitions of trapped surfaces, and we talk about apparent horizons, and um, as opposed to event horizons? So, basically, I guess I'm asking Kevin's question again, um, but um, asking is: is there any intuition that you would expect um, to get from from this? Because in this the standard story, I think, as it stands, is there's no no specific specifically singled out trapped surface that would would mm -hmm. um, count your degrees of freedom um, in a sense and as a entropy would um, I would say in, perhaps... in dynamical situations. So, yeah. is there any 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 inspiration you could get from your work? The first, what I would suggest is to first forget about correlation functions and so on, and go back to global picture or even to flat space. And think of a situation that's not static, like the one I'm doing here, right? So here, everything is invariant under time, and time evolution is trivial. And you want to have a case where time evolution is not trivial. And uh, when is time evolution not trivial? When you are not evolving an eigenstate, right? When you are evolving a linear combination of, uh, of states. And, uh, and then those states evolve because they are not in an eigenstate. If they were in an eigenstate, they would stay stationary. So I think you would need to set up what exactly do you want to compute? You have to tell me what replaces this type of computation first, right? Here I have a state, which is an eigenstate. It evolves for some time, and then it's the same eigenstate. Now, if I have something that's more like a collapse or something, I have to first draw the picture, then understand the analog of the two computations. What, are, what could be the two things? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that will be the two steps. One step is the picture, and step two is having two quantities. Then if you have a picture and if you have two quantities, now you can ask what boundary terms do I put so that I go from one quantity to the other. But, I guess uh, I'm asking about a scenario where I go from, um, like in a Vaitya metric, like you were mentioning, a collapsing shell, um, uh, and then go from one black hole state at a lower temperature, lower mass, to a black hole state. Um, at a higher temperature, mm -hmm. that would be a scenario. Right. Now there are two possibilities there. You can do it Euclidean or Lorentz. Everything I'm saying is very Euclidean. I have really in mind thinking about it. Euclidean ADS-CFT, my boundary mm -hmm. is RD, mm -hmm. and I just have RD plus Z. Then we really should not think so much as one black hole decaying into two, or one decaying, into, it's everything's Euclidean. They're all on equal footing, right? There is just three, for, it's more like soap bubbles, and it's a, a minimization problem. Uh, and in that case, you would be putting three black holes. And now, 
the things are not static, right? So when I do this, you see that here, there is a symmetry. The symmetry acts by mapping this circle to this circle to this circle. And this symmetry of mapping these circles like this is just the original time translation symmetry. This symmetry is gone in this picture. In this picture, there's no such symmetry that maps this circle to this mm. circle. Now the symmetry is totally broken. So as long as, as soon as we go to three point functions, we are very much in the same domain as uh, things not being uh, in. There's no there's no killing symmetry I can use that just tells me the result is trivial, right? So already here I would have to ask what exactly is the horizon, where exactly the horizon would be, and so on. And it's what I said. I would suggest that it is just where space ends, namely to throw geodesic. It's where where the geodesics don't go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I would put a stretch horizon. I should say that in 3D, we can try to make this precise. Because in 3D, we can really find these shapes, find these surfaces, put the horizons, and see where do we need to put them to get the result we want. Because in 3D, we know what the result should be, because there's a totally different way of exploring these three-point functions of very heavy operators that is not through gravity, not through gauge theory, but in 3D, we can use the modular bootstrap. And with the modular bootstrap, we get a beautiful prediction, which is that the statement that three-point function of very heavy operators in any CFT are the same as what they are in Blueville theory. That you can summarize it like this. And so if you know how to compute three-point functions in Blueville theory, which is so-called the so-called DOZZ formula, then that's the prediction. That's a prediction. And now gravity should give you this three-point function of Liouville theory. And now you ask, how do I put correctly all these boundary terms and so on, so that when I then evaluate the action, I get precisely this Liouville theory computation. And you can ask, is this intuition correct, that you put it where the space ends and so on? And uh, more or less the answer is yes. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions? If there's no, I don't right now. I don't see any hands up. So um, we usually uh, have a few minutes after the talk, after the recording ends, where we just informally chat. Um, with that, I would like to thank um, Pedro again. Thank you very much for this very um, inspiring and very clear presentation. Thank you to the audience and to everyone who contributed to the discussion. I'll see you all next week. Thank you.